Welcome to our 7th of January 2021 meeting of the Gawler History Team, where we are ensuring that people are proper socially distancing in this COVID era. We have about 50 in attendance tonight and properly separated from each other. And that is to be expected given the credentials that Peter Jones has in his addressing us on the history of Everson Racecourse and the Gawler and Barossa Jockey Club. Peter and his good wife Judith have done a monumental amount of research on these subjects and it now gives me great pleasure to ask Peter to step up and address us. Give him a moment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ah. Just a preliminary, how we've approached this um, very important subject called the history. Uh, first of all, we'll look at the name and the location, just, just briefly. And then we're going to have a look at uh, the track history itself. Now, the, current, the committee of the race course and the, the CEO... Shane Collins, have uh, very, very graciously given me and my wife full access to all the minutes that are available for the track. And these actually date back to 1892. Um, it's a long way. And there are a couple of volumes missing, but overall we've, we've been able to get a more than ample picture of what went on. We have a number of photographs to back all this up. The um, lead-in to this, I have to put in because it's so important to how this current club started and actually commenced. So we have to give you that little... Uh, OK. Uh, we have to give you that uh, lead-in before we get to the actual minutes of the club. So with the history of the club itself, Almost all the history I'm going to relate to you direct from the minutes themselves, with, in most cases, the dates and even the committee meetings and so forth and so forth, as best I can. But first of all, I'll get my clicker working here. What I can get out of it um, just by explaining to you that Evanston, looking from here on the map, on, and we had the, uh, the uh, section numbers, Evanston was on the right-hand side, looking from here on of Barnet Road and the railway line. Where the race course is situated is on the left-hand side, and that was originally uh, named by Mr. Bassett, and it was called Bassett Town. And that was on the left-hand side of the railway, which you can't see terribly much from this, but because it's around the wrong way. But not to worry. And Mr. Bassett. Who, who named the, that actual situation where the race course is, was um, he had a town school opened in 1866, closed in 1877, and the parliamentary paper of 26 1875 shows it being conducted as a chapel by Sarah P. Giles. So we're going back a fair way on that uh, plot of land. He was the oldest resident of Gawler, colonist of 69 years, died at his residence, Bassett Town, on 12th of April, 1909. Now those blocks, obviously over the years, have split up, different names were, uh, of different people bought them, and in 1880s, the section 3246, which is where the race course is, was registered in the names of Mr W Blackler and Mr Seth Ferry. We will come to those gentlemen as we get that far. Now the, the uh, lead-in that I was going to tell you about belongs to Mr George E. Loyou and the other part of the lead-in to the club belongs to E.H. Coombe, the writings of E.H. Coombe MP. Mr George LaRue states in his history, and this is written prior to uh, 1880, that Gawler was a very popular place for racing. The Gawler district was a popular 
place for racing around the late 40s and the 19 and the 60s. Now, the little thing I'm going to show you now, my wife, we were fossicking around in the oldest building left at the track. And we'll see that later on. The, uh, the remains of that building are the, are the only uh, buildings left at the race course. In our fossicking around with my wife and, and the current CEO, where, where things have been stored for years and years and years, Judy turned up a piece of cardboard that's all been, had the rodents around the edges and so forth and so forth. When she turned it over here, okay. When she turned it over, there's actually a letter pasted on the other side. You got the letter? <coughs> yep. Now, this is dated, and I'll read it directly off the letter for you, 1869. And this is, a, I don't know whether you'll be able to read it from down there, but I've Judy's typed a copy out and I'll read the copy to you. Now this letter was handed to the club, <coughs> sent to the Gawler Jockey Club, 14th of March 1967, from Dr. C. D. Land. 1867. I'm oh, sorry, 1860. No, it was sent to the club in 1967. And it's from his family memoirs. Oh, right. It was actually given to the club in 1967 from his family memoirs. And I'll read that printout that Judy's done for here. And it says, copy of a letter dated 1869, Gawler Autonomous Races, March the 7th, 1869. I'm instructed by the Gawler Race Committee to address you upon the subject of issuing on the occasion of the forthcoming Gawler Races Cheap return tickets, respectfully suggesting that tickets returnable on the 17th, 18th and 19th be issued advantageously to the railways and parties interested in the races. May I, there, may I therefore respectfully request that you will lay the subject before the Commissioners and favour me with a communication at your earliest convenience upon the subject. The Committee will meet on Thursday evening. Next, when a line from you will be esteemed a favour, I remain, dear sir, Yours respectfully, E. L. Grundy. And it's addressed to R. Borak on Esquire, Secretary of SA Railways. And there's a lot of illegible things we couldn't pick up. But on the right hand side of the letter, it's got, in this instance, I believe tickets may be issued with advantage at excursion rates. For instance, first class from Adelaide, 10 shillings, Salisbury, 5 shillings, Smithfield, 2 and 6. And second class, 6 shillings, from Adelaide, two and six from Salisbury, and one and six from Smithfield. Thank you, Nick. That's a very rare piece of actual the arrival of Mr. Jazz Jenkins, a practical trainer, and his settling down within a quarter of a mile from the railway station was the first step towards awakening, reawakening public interest. Having been connected with training of horses and horse racing in the colonies from Boyer, he has here, from here formed, from a paddock of about 90 acres, or a mile and a furlong in extent, a splendid race course, and spared neither money nor labour to get a perfect track. In the, on this course, at present, Mr Jenkins' horses are trained. And there is on the establishment some excellent boxes and stabling. Mrs. Mr Jenkins has been 20 odd years in connected with the turf Victoria and South Australia, and has high, in, as in, as it is in high esteem. It, the English pastoral racing men and the jockey club has recently started. Now this is the jockey club that was started at, at, uh, and raced on the Para Para race course of Mr Dutton. And they formed a committee. The committee we have to remember, the committee member that is important at this particular stage is Mr. E. S. Burkett. And also the date of this meeting is very important because it's 1879. 
Now, 1879 is the date taken by the Gora Chockey Club at the moment for its, the start of its centenary. It is also the date, it happens to coincide with the date, that the TAB was formally licensed to be operated on race courses by the state government. And the TAB, the, the tote rather at that time, was a simple operation where punters put their money into a, a, a fund through a clerk with a ticket or whatever that were situated on race courses. The money was totaled up. The club took a dividend, the government took a dividend, the rest of the money was divvied up and paid to the winners. And by the way, when the tota actually started, they only paid first and second. And the remainder was always seems to be fractions. And by government legislation, those fractions had to be paid to a registered charity. That was the deal that the government uh, put forward and was legislated in 1879. Currently, it was the same day as the initial date for the centenary of this particular club. However, after the first meeting, Mr. Dutton was very sick. So the, the, the club actually did not continue and it fizzled out. In the 1880s, and we've got three clubs here, we have to be very careful, there are three clubs and three committees. That was the first one. The following year, this is after 1879, everything was successful for the meeting, stakes were raised, Mr. Double was sick, and the, bat, the uh, use of para-para grounds was uh, uh, unable to be used. In the early 80s, there was a revival of racing again, and the Everson course was first utilised. Not made, formed, built, but utilised. So this second club actually utilised the facilities that the trainer, who Mr Johnson, who arrived, that he had actually started. So this second committee, and we think, but not certain that the first race was about 1882, but certainly it was uh, inaugurated, that club was inaugurated on March the 17th, 1883. Mr Burkett, from that first committee, I won't re have to read you all the, the members of the committee because we were running out of time, but Mr Burkett was also on that committee. Now that committee lasted the maximum of nine years, and it faded. There is no given reason why that faded in Mr. Coombs' rel relating of what happened at that particular time, and we're talking on his part of the history at the present moment. However, if we look further afield, there is a major problem that arose at that particular time in 1883. And that is, the government, the state government, that okayed the use of the tote in 1879, passed a bill banning the use of the tote, under pressure from public, banning the use of the tote on the race course. And if we read the history throughout Australia, that sort of thing happens not only here, but um, in other places as well. And this, and other states as well. And this this brought down some of the clubs who were starting and some of the smaller clubs because the, the money they were getting, their share of the tote, disappeared. In three years the after this banning, the state government brought back the tote and allowed it on race courses, but he immediately banned bookmakers. <laughs> so from one from one disaster to the other, and this was the big disaster because bookmakers are part of racing hierarchy, part of the tradition of racing, and people just stayed away. They just didn't go. And that may contribute to the downfall of that interim club that happened there. We don't know for sure, but that's the only reason I can find for a definite possibility that it had to fade. 
But remember that card number two, because later on we might have to re refer to it again. On March 1891, the present Jockey Club was formed, and we've arrived at the Jockey Club we have now. And bookmakers, the, the government has seen the, the error of their ways and reinforced, reinstated the bookmakers on the track, so they were allowed again. The other interesting thing here is Mr. Burkett. He is the only member of the first club, the second club, and the third club. He went, he's the link between those, those three clubs. Number three, please. Oh, by the way, before we get before this goes, um, we've got to thank um, a lady at uh, the uh, uh, train museum. Um, to, um, she has been a great help in, in um, investigating, if possible, what as far back as she can go as far as engines. This is locomotive number one. This is. 20 years before James Martin made his, his engines, his steam engines in, uh, in Gore. Mm. Locomotive actually number one. Mm. And as you can see there, um, masts are not exactly new. This guy got one on here. I'm sure Professor Spurrier would be very pleased about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. The uh, chairman, Mr. Robinson, this is now we're getting to 1892, the present club. He, his address in uh, his uh, reporting for 1892, 1893, Mr. Robinson was the chairman. We are without doubt passing through one of the most trying financial times that has ever visited Australia. General Depression and the Broken Hill Strike. This is 1892-1893. On in addition to that, uh, Mr. Frankel had started a, uh, a an agency in Adelaide, taking the money, the nomination fees and acceptances from that you do on race courses for uh, a fee. The fee was uh, five pounds per per annum. Anyhow. This became a habit that, that, and there were a lot, we talk about Gawler being the race course, but around us and around the Barossa Valley, there were heaps of races going on. Once or twice a year, you only needed an open space and you could run a race meeting. And that was the centre, um, Ian said to me when he got here tonight, this is more like the community efforts to get people together. Well, that's what racing was used very early in the piece in Australia all over Australia, and nonetheless in this area and in the valley. And I can list a heap of race courses up to you in a moment that did exist. Mr. Frank was started this racing agency in Adelaide. When the result was when the secretary went to collect the money owed to the race court, to the race club, Mr. he disappeared. And Mr. Robinson, the chairman, said, and I quote, when we had him arrested, he had no money. £51 plus legal fees, £15, became a loss to the club through mysterious legal technicalities. No rate, no money was, was recovered. Now, we have also found a copy of the auditor's report for 1893. And this is for the year of 1892, and I'll read it to you. Copy of Orders Report, 27th of March, 1893, to the Chairman of the Gordon Brossett Jockey Club and members. Gentlemen, we, are, uh, we, your auditors, beg to report that we have examined the balance sheet for the June and November meetings, with the vouchers produced and find the same to be agreed. We congratulate the club on its strong financial position, but we think it necessary to make a few suggestions to the members for future meetings and for the continuance of prosperity to the club. We suggest that a proper set of books be procured, procured journal, cash book, ledger, minute book, also that the forms of noms and acceptances have these words printed on them as we find several in checking not filled in. Sounds like a recovery job. This is likely to 
cause disturbance and can be easily avoided. Also, your committee should consider the matter of printed, of printed receipt forms with proper heels and bookmakers' tickets. We should also suggest that on race days, your secretary should have a properly qualified man to take charge of the gate tickets, issue same and check the returns and cash from each man, and also issue, issue tickets to the bookmakers that any officer of the club appointed for the purpose can see that it's not eligible, is not imposed on. This leaves your secretary free to supervise various matters and see that such things as scratchings, etc., are attended to properly. We consider your secretary with limited offices conveniences has done a great as good services and if supplied with what we suggest will assist him greatly to be the club's benefit. Wishing you prosperity at future meetings, we have the honour to remain A Lardy L C B Nor Auditors. And that is eighteen ninety three for the year eighteen ninety two. There is also, this is a bit of a mystery. When you see the pictures directly, go, go, go to number four if you like, thank you. When you see the pictures directly, there are two grand, the grandstand and the derby stand. There are, in the records, there, are, there is evidence that these were built before 1994, uh, 1894, sorry about that, 19, 1894. <coughs> in, there is one clue in the minutes, and it's dated 11th of April, 1894, and the clue is, Mr. Blackler, who owned the land at that time, accepted this position as judge in ensuring in, for the ensuing year. Now also, he, on the 18th of November 1894, he insured the grandstand for one pound one shillings with the South Australian Insurance Company, mm -hmm. Gawler Jockey Club to pay. Now, if they weren't built before 1894, they surely wouldn't be insuring them. And, 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 and the mystery is, seems to be, when were they built? Because this club only got going in 1891. And we've got more of that mystery later on, so I'll leave it with you and you'll see another part of that mystery. A few racing, this is at 16th of December 1895. 16th of December 1895, a few, a few this, this, and this is a key, we have found the key to a lot of questions that have been asked about that race course. A few racing men take exception to our course being right-handed. But as New South Wales race almost exclusively that way, and Victorians feel no disability, I don't think any argument advanced here will warrant us in all truth. In other words, the chairman didn't want anything to do with changing it at that particular time. But to shortcut it, it was changed, and eventually in 1901. So therefore, we must assume that the original trainer had his horses going the, the uh, right-handed way. And that stayed until 1901. And that gives us a clue as to where some of those buildings actually appeared on that race course. Those original buildings appeared on the race course. In the meantime, there was an offer for the estate to Blackler. Uh, Mr. Blackler died, and an offer was made for the estate. And uh, uh, there was also a query whether they, this club could actually continue at Gawler. And the a, a, a committeeman from this club was sent to the estate, to the officer of the estate of Mr. Duffield, and, and he, they told him that, that the estate of Mr. Duffield was not in a position to grant an annual lease of Parapara. Para. So that finished that 
connection altogether. 24th of May, 1898, at committee meeting, correspondence from Mr. G. Taylor asking if a horse is qualified to run at Corley if it had run at the picnic races at Freeling. And that was a thriving race course as well at Freeling. The committee replied, OK, as long as I'm not raced at a meeting where the stakes exceeded £25. Now we've got to the su a summary of 1900, and as you can see, those three committees had to really fight to get this stuff, this club going. They had to battle the de a depression, and they had to battle a fellow who knocked off some of their money and, uh, and, and got away with it. And ladies and gentlemen, in 90 years' time, from this date of 1900, the committees who were involved then are going to have to fight just as hard to retain this club and retain that race course. 90 years time from where we are now, 90, 1900. Everton race course, they paid eight, 1,500 pounds. The property would need to mortgage of 1,000 pounds. And the other, uh, annual report for 1901, many improvements have been made on the course in the direction of races altered, changed to the anti-clockwise in that period, 1901, as, we, as we've just said. In 1909, there was a match race between, this is where we get to the other side of the horse business, a match race between two trotters, Gypsy and Motor. Motor was ridden, uh, Gypsy and Motor, yeah, Motor was ridden, Gypsy was driven, and Motor won over the two-mile race, over the two-mile race course. On the 1910 in March, Gawler Jockey Club included a £50 dollar race for trotters and paces. In a later year, have a listen to this, 36 horses arrived by train for a trotting meeting. That's a huge number. This is <coughs> the biggest military camp in South Australia at that stage on the race course. A couple of things I'd like to have a close look at, and the main thing is this here, this date, Easter 1914. Now Easter 1914, Easter Sunday was the 12th of the 4th. Remember that, it's the 12th of the 4th. The other kids, just move it sideways in, please. bit further, or the other way, whatever. Just here, here we are, so I'll stop. <coughs> also take note, this hurdle is already is erected. Now this, take notice of this date, this is the large record meeting. This is the 25th <coughs> of April, 1914. Compare that to your date of the big Army camp, it's only 13 days for their events. <coughs> now any, all those committeemen and next committeemen that are here today, and you know how hard it is and how much work you have to do to prepare a race course. This is a phenomenal effort in 13 days from that camp to this. The two grandstands, the, there's the grandstand there, we can go this way please Ian. No, the other way. This. And there's the Derby stand over here. And we go right over to the right hand side and focus on the left, please, Ian. Focus on the left. Right. <coughs> now this particular picture is a three pictures joined together. If you look at this here, there's a join over the H. And if you look here, there's a join over the E. Three, three photographs joined together. Here is that original building I type, spoke about. The re bare remains of this, and this is a building it's a, a, the council believed to be the original building, the bare remains of this remain, as you will see soon. This appears to be taken when there is about to be a race start. And you can see the con people congregating around where the race is due to start. Now, no, stay there, stay there, stay there. 
Back, right here, back again. Yeah. Back to Rwanda. Yeah. He, just here is one of the rare pictures of what they called in those days a starting machine. And that is two posts, two rails, and in front of this are some strands. Very often they're called, particularly in the state, called strand barriers. When the horses <coughs> were lined up behind them as close as possible, facing the race, the, the, the way they were going to go, the starter would pull a counterweight and that would go down at the back and lift this strand, these strands up at the, at the, at the front. Uh, John Schultz can remember these barriers and he can also remember when these strands, these poles did not co cooperate and one would start to go higher than the other and the horses on the inside would be impeded to a degree. <laughs> now this is, apart from that, if you look closely, there is a horse coming down in, just in here. Can you see there's a horse and rider just coming down towards the start there and there's another horse just in here which is hard to see on this side here. And also, <clears throat> we go to the right-hand side a little bit now in. This gentleman here, we've seen this, any of you know, on the race course, you've seen this stance many times where the steward's heading out to his post to observe the races. Nowadays they head out to a car to drive around. And it's possible that this guy here is also a steward heading out, whether this one is or not, I don't know. But this stance is very, very popular uh, for, for the, the, to uh, you see on race courses with the stewards going out. Can we go back to the grandstand, please? Yeah. Now, the lady at the council, just sitting the weeds at the council, is in charge of the uh, heritage section. She's done a lot of research for us also. Now, this is the grandstand I said is a bit of an enigma. Because, in, there's that horse there, you can see it going down to the start, just cantering down with the rider on just there. Yep. In the council office, in Jacinda's care, is the most fantastic drawing of a grandstand you've ever seen in your life. It's about, I don't know, three, four feet wide, by the same height. <coughs> we had to lay it out on a big table and put lead weights on it to lay it out. It's in multiple layers. It's got a, a front elevation, side elevation, back elevation, and so forth. And Jacinda explained to me, it is not a concept drawing. It's the final working drawings to build the grandstand. It does not remember, resemble that grandstand. It, that one in the council is dated, signed, for the Gorda Brosser Jockey Club, 1893. I mentioned that mystery before, it, it comes again. This grandstand is not that one on the, on the, on the, in the concept. She's got it wrapped up in virtually in cotton wool to keep it it's in such a fantastic condition. If you look closely at this, <laughs> it could be a very cheap version of the one Jacinda's got in the count, the drawing she's got in the council. And also, if you look not too closely, you don't need to, but it's all out of kilter here. This is not in the middle at all. So, it, it, again, we've got that mystery. Why was that grandstand, all those drawings paid for and not built? Was it too expensive? Is, it, is this a cheaper version? It's not even a real grandstand. Official program, in the meantime, the letter from Major Horson of the 4th Injury, injury requesting the use of the course from the 10th of August to the 10th of November for military purposes. And then we had a blue with the council. The, camp, the, the co committee... Someone says, what's new? Uh, the, the committee had... A, a, this was an ongoing... It went on from a few meetings. Finally, it reached a head. It's regarding the sharpening of a mower. Now, the, the Gawler Corporation and the club went halves 
of all things, in a mower. It doesn't describe what mower it was, horse drawn or whatever it was, but it was a mower. And the letter of the town clerk said, as the club has continued use of the council mower, it might be mutually satisfactory for the club to purchase the machine. And the reason was, as in previous uh, entries in the minutes, that the sharpening of it, the club actually used it and sent it back when the, when the council wanted it. And the council complained that they had to keep sharpening the darn mower. So what happened in the finish? The council said, well, we're, we're sick of sharpening this mower. You buy the darn mower and you sharpen it yourselves. So that's the end. The council requested 17 pounds and that was paid. Mm. And finally the dispute was over. And if you read the minutes that went on, because the, you know, the, this is not done by telephone, this is by month by month by month, all these sorts of uh, communications. Request from the jockey club for Gawler uh, for a race to race in Adelaide, as the Gawler is, rec is uh, debarred from racing in October, uh, 6th of October 1916, Wolverville course allotted to Gawler for racing fixture. Rental of 85 pounds plus 10 percent of all net profits over 100 pounds. That goes towards the the Wolverville course. <coughs> committee meeting, Cheltenham Racecourse had to be used. Special train for a run from Gawler to Cheltenham. Capunda Race Club applied for use of Evanston Racecourse for the race meeting on the 22nd of September 1917. 30th of March 1917, the committee meeting request from the Secretary of the Sandy Creek Races requesting the use of the Sandy Saddle Cross. They were granted the use of the old saddle cloths. This happened a number of times with Sandy Creek. They were borrowed those so, for their races. 1918, 8th of March, Gawler Catholic Pickney races. Use of the course, Gawler Committee requested supply judges for the races. You will see more about the Catholic races directly. Now, we have another alteration to the track. 1918, 21st of September, the committee meeting, following a request from the stewards, the racing track was to be altered to conform with peaks marking new turns and straight. There had been a couple of accidents, maybe because it was designed to go the other way. 10th of June, 1919, permission given to the South Gawler South Football Club to erect goalposts to play football on the course, not on the racing surface. No trains on the 1919, 21st of July. The Crown Solicitor would not allow the transfer of the tote licence to alternative vendor of park, so the race meeting had to abandon. It was also abandoned another time because of the coal strike and there were no trains. Um, committee meeting, communication for Mrs. Ms. D.I., there's a famous caller name. I, Miss D.I., Secretary of the Red Cross Society, requesting support from Gawler Jockey Club in buying a motor ambulance. It's about time because a, a, a pony ambulance was employed in 1894 and I would put the pony as approximately 26 years old at least. So <laughs> I, I think Miss I must have had a good look at the pony and decided she'd do something about it. Now, here's, now, here's the benefit of a good, good CEO. 10th of December 1919, Deputy Minister of Taxation, Federal Taxation, asked for names and addresses of jockeys to whom amounts were paid for the year ending the 30th, 1919. Now, there's a couple of jockeys in this, in this, uh, in this audience tonight. I know. Names supplied by the CEO. And his reply included, addresses impossible. <laughs> what, a, what a CEO to have, eh? <laughs> um, and I say, we, 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 we'd rather go a little bit highfalutin now. On the 15th of December 1919, the committee meeting, the playing of golf and lawn tennis on the race course is restricted to members of the club, their wives, sons and daughters, 
and staff of the Union Bank, but no other person. <laughs> Just between you and me, I wouldn't even consider playing tennis on the middle of that club because that was 1919, <coughs> in April 1920, a committee meeting from a request from Butler, Cowper, Aviation Company for permission to use the course on Saturday the 10th of April, April for aviation purposes, permission granted. So you'd be out there playing tennis in the plane going to land on it. <laughs> not, not, not the best. Ah, uh, dear, dear. Um, Castic braces. Next, oh, we got the castic braces. This is the. Oh, we put that on before you. Oh, sorry. You to put that on the table later on. You can see there, first and second only in the early day. Uh, castic braces, please. Ian. Yes, this is when the Catholic braces actually ran the whole a whole race race program themselves, and you can see who the chief. Worry, 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 worry. You can see who the chief steward is. Things, believe me, things are going to be run pretty darn well, you can imagine. <laughs> Rick, we're going home. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, after that we had uh, 22 requests from the 4th District Base Commander applying for use of the camp, use of the course for camp training from the 6th to the 11th of March. And it gives you, this will give you the idea of the number of, of, of officers on the track. This is for a total of 850 officers and 450 horses in a training camp. So that's to give you an idea of the number who were coming off and on that race course, off and on for many, for quite a few years. The chairman report is a. It's a pity the CEO is not here tonight. He's on holidays. October 20, uh, 23rd of October 20, 1922. The chairman reported his attention has been drawn to persons obtaining free admission to the course through the lavatory windows. <laughs> Secretary instructed to try to catch offenders at the next race meeting. I'm just and this Ian, the current CEO, sitting on the loo waiting for these people to come <laughs> through the windows. And if you look at that old building, the, the little windows are right on, mm. right on the roadside. Okay, next slide, please, Ian. Now, this is an interesting uh, slide. This is the, this uh, is a picture of 1925, and it's a South Australian South Australian Sporting Motor Club. Need that in a minute. And they applied for use of the for the club for motorsport four days per year, specific days to be arranged at twenty towns per day. And this was held <coughs> between for four to six years. Just for the petrol heads, the uh, this the, the 1925 meeting. 7,000 people attended. In 1926, 15,000 people attended the race yeah. course. Mm. On the left hand side at the top is Colin Grant. He won five events, uh, including the 350cc solo championship. On the right hand side is, uh, is, is L. Brook, <coughs> first. The one on the right hand side of those three. Uh, the next person is Mr. Dunstan, L.A. Dunstan was second, and Moyle, A.T. Moyle, was third. Mr. Ferguson won several events. He's the guy on the left, down the bottom. And the interesting one is Mr. Moyle, winner of the car match race. In a, as far as we can determine the writing, it was a 7.79 horsepower Austin. And apparently these were. Very, very um, uh, uh, popular events held on the race course for a number of years. I, I'm, in the minutes too, there was a couple of frames that happened. So whether that caused the seat, the seizure of that, I, I don't know. Right, Mayor, uh, this is 
In the meantime, the office of this club was in the town hall. And on 25th of June 1923, the Mayor of Gawler, Mr Cox, suggested the club move into rooms formerly used as a mayor's parlour in the town hall, currently used in another room in the town hall. In other words, they were elevated to a better room. If you can bring that up. This is courtesy, this picture is very rare. It's courtesy of the art itself. Um, if you bring down the picture itself, yeah. This, um, um, probably, um, this charge is for the Hutton Trophy. And the Hutton Trophy was donated for the best charge by a, a section of the military on the race course itself. As you can see, it's very old and uh, com competing. The four, four squadrons competed, there were four in the regiment, and the best, best charge wins the Hutton Trophy, judged by obviously the officers of the that's all we need on that. I've, I've, I've have added a little thing. Just go up in. Uh, up. No, no, too far. I've included this for uh, 1936 horse breeding rigs to peak with 17,636 foals in South Australia, according to Dr. Culligan, principal of Rosary, in his horse population. And just as a, a a reminder of how many horses were being bred in this area and the Brossa Valley. The lady in the train museum actually got the poster. She found the poster after a lot of searching for it. And the interesting thing on that poster just go up here, please. Up. And give us a wide. I see the whole poster, could we? Please. See the whole poster. The interesting thing is under the wording under these excursion tickets, they actually had a train. Word, word, word. That's it. They actually had a train. Here. Running from Borough. We can bring it up. From right here we are. Robertstown, Truro, Angerson, Brinkworth, and, and over here is the word Borough. They had weekend uh, tickets to come to the races from a far provider's borough. So you can see that Gawler was very, very popular in that era. The next interesting thing that happened was in. 1936, trainers and the club arranged for transport for Victoria Park train horses to be transported to the Britannia Hotel. This is the one, the Britannia in in uh, Adelaide, next to Victoria Park. To transported to Britannia Hotel yards from Adelaide railway station after the after a Gawler race meetings. Mr. Goodman will transport the horses for five shillings ahead from the railway station to the Victoria, to the Britannia Hotel. And the reason for that, the trains were coming from all the stations in Adelaide that were near, or anywhere near train establishments or race courses. Victoria Park, there's no <coughs> race course, no uh, train. Horses were arriving in Adelaide late at night and they had to be led from the station to the stables at Big Park. So the trainers and the club arranged for that situation where this Mr. Goodman apparently had some sort of horse transport and he would take them to the, the uh, Britannia Hotel yards and they could be walked over the road to the, to the stables at Victoria Park. Here we are. That's, that's it. Ten year lease of the race course at Lights Pass. That's the Angleton race, race course. Negotiated and uh, on their race course at Light Pass. This is official racing week. This is another thing that happened so many times on these tracks. There was racing going on, but they weren't registered with the South Australian Jockey Club or anything like that. They were called in this state picnic races. 
Victoria they call pygmy ricers. In, in New South Wales, they are often, more often called pony ricers. Principally the same, and a lot of the races weren't done by a real handicap, but they were done by the height of the horse. Uh, and maybe there was only one meeting a year, two meetings a year, as we said earlier, as a get-together for the, for the locals in, in, in various towns. But this is their attempt to bring uh, their meetings up to official meetings registered with the South Australian Jockey Club. Okay. At this stage in 1938, free rail and return freight to all horses which started in a race of gore are travelling from Adelaide, Edwardstown, Hopelands, Semaphore and Cheltenham for the forthcoming Gawler Cup meeting on May. in May. Distance was one and a half miles by the way. So free transport on the train from any of those stations to the Gawler Club and back again. Now there's a problem here with broadcasting. The ABC, other broadcasting outlets were at loggerheads on who was going to get contracts to broadcast racing. And in the Jockey Club minutes, what seemed to be at first a strange entry, and it was all on its own. Letters received from Johnson and Company and Mr. F. D. Donoghue. Water Martineau and Company of London reporting that the Judicial Council of the Privy Council had refused to grant special leave to appeal in the broadcasting case. Now that appeals out of nowhere in the minutes of the John Club meeting. On investigation, on investigation, The, and I checked this with a lawyer in Adelaide. The, if you had a, a dispute with anything that the High Court of Australia had up until the 1970s, which surprised me, up until the 1970s, you could appeal to the Privy Council in, in, the, in the UK. And the only thing we can think the only connection we can think of of that being in this book was a reply to the appeal which is similar to this. The Australian Jockey Club had an appeal to the Privy Council in London. This is a couple of years before this business had brought it. Regarding the Supreme Court racing against two bylaws that were imposed by the High Court of Australia and they won that high, high Court appeal in London. Now somehow, someone, maybe the AJC, has taken that up for the whole of Australia about some, dis some decision that the High Court has given regarding the broadcasting of races. But in this case, the appeal has been turned down. That's the only answer we can find, or I can find, to that entry being in this, in this book. In the minutes, I'm sorry. And to continue on, does anyone remember the Rover Football Club? Committee meeting in April 8, 1939. Request from the Rover Football Club to use a portion of the course as football ground on six Saturdays for the season <coughs> at a charge of nine pounds. That's, that's the, <coughs> I put this on for a special purpose. No, the whole side, please, Ian, just the whole side. Like that. Yeah. This is the Angerson race course. The lights pass here. This is this is oh, we can't see the date on this here. Maybe we can bring it up and see the date in a minute. But this no. No, just go uh, yeah. There it is, you can see it there. May thirty nine. There it is. Fifth of thirty nine. Okay, the whole slide again. I put this all together for the, for the coincidences that happened. This is a Lindsay Park handicap being run here, or being won here. And this is another date of the Gawler Race Committee here. Now the trainer of this horse, the, winning of, the winner of this horse, eventually owned Lindsay Park. 
common heights. It's just a series of coincidences. And while we're here, you can see the infill of the Gawler race course as it was in those days. Yeah. When we go to Gawler Jump Victoria Park race course, winter meeting, official Gawler Jump Club program. The, by the way, the time to, uh, over all those disputes early on, the telephone number of the club was 301, and that was retained. I've got it here in 1944, still retained. Now, in 1944, the committee meeting authorised Dr. Coverton, A. Carter and F. B. Winnan were empowered to purchase all machinery and material to repair the whole of the race course. This is after the, the, uh, the uh, Second World War. Victoria Park race course, Gawler Jumping Club Cup meeting. This was a very, very uh, profitable meeting for, for the club. This is the new, this is the new tote building. This is the duplex tote. There were various versions before this offered to Gawler and some fell by the wayside, some were small. Behind this is a, a very, I've seen the pictures of this type of tote building, a very complicated issue where the odds are being worked out and the, the uh, here is the gap here. This was erected between those two stands. One was here and one was this side. And here is the, gut, the fence between the two stands. Here are the, the tote windows around here. One for the, the dar for the Derby stand and one for the grandstand. Next one, please see. The comparison between that tote building you saw and the tote today. And that's, that's all it is. It's all computerised. The, the, TV screens, etc., etc. Now, this is one of Mr. Tickles was introduced a while ago, and his father, as he said, uh, worked here for 20 odd years, and Mr. Tickle was raised here, and this is one of his. He's very kind. Uh, his father took a number of slides, and uh, Mel very kindly had some of them converted to photographs so we could use them. And this is a fantastic picture. And it gives you an idea of the track as it was in the 1950s, 60s. And you can see the old, the stalls were starting to be were, were over here for a period of time. They were moved down a little bit further, but the new stalls were built on Mr. Mrs. New. Now leave it, leave it on, please. The new stalls were built just on this piece of land here. This is the original old stalls that were put there. The uh, bookmaker stands, as you can see in front here. No, please leave it there. Just leave it there. That's it, leave it there. Thank you. Um, you, you have an idea that this is out in the open of the bookmaker stands. And the South Australian Jockey Club, for a cut, one of the cut meetings, asked the committee how many bookmakers they would take for their cup meeting at Gordon. And the committee re replied, all 45 of them. Nowadays, we have one here, and there's two come along with it at occasional times. So that's the, the difference in those the bookmakers in those days and what they are today. And these were the buildings, the, the jockey's uh, room, sewage, restaurant along here and you can also see how the track went around here. Now over the years this this track has changed a number of times. And we'll get for a bit more of that track in the next slide. Thank you very much. And thanks you all for doing some of these photographs for us. Starting dates. We saw one starting date and um, I just want to mention that a very, years and years ago, the start was with a, a steward waving a flag. Then the, the, another device was one strand of rubber going across the, the track and being uh, sprung to allow the horses to go past. The, the other one was the, uh, as they call it, the starting machine, was a strand barrier. 
And then the club um, had a had a, uh, a meeting with the uh, um, Adelaide Jockey Club and the uh, and the, Med and the uh, AJ, um, SAJC and the Port Adelaide Jockey Club, and they got together and they purchased a similar type of starting machine to this, starting barrier to this, but much heavier, and they owned it between the race clubs. And when they purchased them in those days, they were very, very heavy machines. They had to be towed by a prime mover. So when they purchased them, instead of just being towed around the track by a tractor, they had to be towed from one meeting to the other, with the prime mover along the roads. Gradually over the years they've been fine been fine tuned to <coughs> what we have today. Have you got an overall picture of that? That's, a longer that's the whole picture. That's the whole picture. No, no problems at all. Now at one stage in that strand barrier system at Gawler, they tried to separate the horses similar to what they're separated in this barrier, in these stores. And in doing so, they tried a system where they put across the, the, the track in chutes where the, the track goes off at an angle and allows the race to go on in the circle and doesn't, in, doesn't involve that chute. At one stage, they put a, a, two posts and a rider between each horse all along here. It became so dangerous that at one particular committee meeting, one of the committeemen said, should we send out a spare jockey? Because so many jockeys were being hurt, should we send out a spare jockey? Which of course was out of the question, but he made his point. And that idea was uh, pulled up and, and did away with because it was too dangerous. There, are, there were occasions before the barriers were even brought in where it's, uh, and John, Children can rem even remember this one as well. There were so many horses lined up to start on one particular start that they actually started as you do in trotting races in two rows in the one race, which is pretty hairy stuff that they have done a couple of times. The numbers of horses early on are almost comparable as to what they are getting now. In other words, you get, they were getting 20 odd nominations per race years and years ago and we've just about got to that stage back again in South Australia at the present moment. Those, that uh, starting machine was known as the Pell Mobile Starting Gates, by the way. The Gawler three day event, first event in 1959 and this was jumping at the, 80, at the 1985 event and eventually we had the World Championships here in 1986, based at Rosalie College and performing at the Gawler Racecourse. Next slide please Ian. And so that's the uh, visual that we saw before, similar to the same thing that Mel had on his next one. Rosser Valley Racing Club, inaugural meeting. And this was at the Gawler Racecourse, their first official meeting, run by Rare Gift. Next meeting, please. Next slide. The Emerson Club actually teamed with the Borough Race Club, which was, you'd think, would be unusual, but they did, to put on the Lord Mayor's Council Appeal Race Meeting, which raised I haven't got the, mo the money here, but it raised a, an enormous amount of money for, the, for that particular meeting. Now we have a problem. <laughs> this, this, had, this, this had to come. <laughs> Mr. Easton. He stepped in and he, he banned two horses from running. Next slide, too, please. That involves Mr. E, Dr. Eastick as well. 
Now, he, the, vet, the, the trainers didn't do anything wrong. The horses were treated, and one of them was a common hazel. One of them was treated, they were treated in Adelaide by a veterinary surgeon, and for whatever. And that, in those days, you had to give a written uh, treatment form to the race club you were racing at if you had the horse treated, which the trainers did. However, when Dr. Easton read those treatment forms, in his opinion, those treatments did not uh, conform to his, his um, thoughts on what would affect a horse and what wouldn't affect a horse. He was the vet on the day. The stewards had to go along with what he said. He banned those two horses. Probably the best thing that happened to racing at that time, to be quite frank, because it led to a big conference in Sydney in which Dr. Eastick was asked to attend. The Veterinary Association was formed to deal with racing. And in the end of that, over the years, the treatment of horses, the control of, of veterinary work on horses, and the licensing of, licensing of veterinary surgeons who are, who are associated with race horses has evolved. And in, in, in this instance, Dr. Easter has done a wonderful job in, in holding his nerve, stating his opinion, and uh, that's what evolved from it, the Veterinary Association of Australia evolved from that. So it's, it's a fantastic job. This is another one of Mel's tickles uh, 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 photographs. And this is, <coughs> the, you can see this old building still here, part of it's still there. And this is, as Mel's father saw, the, the extension to that grandstand. Now those are two original grandstands that stump stage were demolished. We haven't got specific dates on that. This one was built in 1937. The current, uh, the current in this photograph was built in 1937 in almost the same place as the original grandstand. You can see how close it is to this old building as it was originally, the original one. But this one is being extended. Next slide, please. Here. This is the committee. And we go up with the names underneath them. Gawler and Barossa Jock. Gawler and Barossa Jockey Club Committee. This is after the amalgamation of the Angerston Race Club, which had already joined with the licensed Victualers Club from Adelaide and called themselves the Barossa Racing Club. And so this became, on that amalgamation, the Gawler and Barossa Jockey Club. Okay, in 1963, the Corporation of Gawler chucked the, the, uh, the uh, Gawler Committee out of the uh, town hall. They had 21 days to get out, and officers uh, and the officers within three calendar months. Gawler Jockey Club office transferred to the post office rail in Gawler at that particular time. Next one. Steeple chasing return. Jimmy Smith won this race. He's still training in Adelaide. And many of you may re might remember the Trim store in Adelaide. And the Trim brothers owned that particular horse that uh, Jimmy Smith trained to win that race that day. One thing I want to make mention of, when we said we introduced the business about the, the tote and the fractions. Now there was a lot of angst from certain churches about betting on a tote and they, write, they wrote letters to the council and the mayor and the race clubs. I'll just give you a slide, a quick list. In the early 30s and 40s those fractions went to St. Society of St. Vincent de Paul, St. John's Ambulance, Convalescent House, Hutchinson Hospital, 
Mothers and Babies Health Fund, Salvation Army, Red Cross, Red Riot, Fighting Forces, Comfort Fund, Combined Racing War Fund for Committee, Children's Hospital. Now in those early times, 30, 30s to the 40s, those, they were in say maybe four pounds, six pounds, ten pounds, eight pounds each after a couple of race meetings. 1955, the fractions total 389 pounds, 18 shillings and 7 pence given to charities from three race meetings. In 56, that was 450 pounds, and in 57, it was 721 pounds. Now, eventually, the tote has been taken over by the Totalizer Agency Board, which now control the totalizer itself and the fractions all go to the government. Mm. Unfortunately, the charities miss out, which is a, well, a bit of a shame. The Australian Jockey Club New South Wales Re Racing Veterinary Conference at Randwick requests Mitt Dr. Eastick to attend, and this is when he had to go over and uh, speak to his. Uh, his commitments about put, putting those two as horses out of race. The Angerston Race Club under when, uh, Mr. Hill Smith seemed to be a very uh, financial race club. For this reason, <coughs> Gawler wasn't going so good in 66, 1966. An agreement to borrow thirty thousand dollars from the Barossa Valley Racing Club at interest of four percent for ten years to help the Gawler Club out of a bit of a problem. Decimal currency, nineteen sixty six. Discussion regarding the currency of new betting odds. Committee meeting, Mr. J. Schultz, Schultz and Mr. C. <coughs> Marlow trainers attended the committee meeting to put various requests to the committee. The, end of the, the introduction of the, of the tab and on the, the big problem arose 4th of May 1967, conference at Gawler Racecourse, the loss of Saturday meetings, Gawler became from a Saturday meeting to a provincial club. Committee meeting trainers with Gawler Jockey Club, trainers reps, Les Rell, Clary Marlow, Ambr Ambrose Little, and Barry O'Brien requested a meeting with the club. Barry O'Brien was the trainers rep, and organ he organ Barry here tonight. Uh, Barry organised many uh, picnic races to raise funds for the for the club and for the trainers association and uh, he was also a very successful trainer along with Les and Clary Marlow and Ambrose Little. And this is the committee of the have we got names on this one? Seven thousand. Okay. Alex Bean. Alex is there, yes. John Shores. Now here we go. That's the committee. Now there's a couple here of people you can recognise. This bloke here, when he stands up out of his chair, you'll see what's. Um, this was done, um, drawn by uh, a fellow called Shepherdson, and it's a, a bit of a light hearted time in between the race course having problems and for the non-racing people in between races and after the races there has to be a team that go around and fill all, all the uh, footholes in there and this is drawn and the boss here has got the people out to uh, with their buckets to fill all these holes in here and if, can you bring up the comments at the bottom please Ian Stick to your typewriter. Stick to your typewriter. Short legs. 
Marshall's here behind God and Dale. I didn't hear you out and we feel a lot faster in the old days. Now this is a not um, the best side of this gentleman on the screen. But it's a very, very important picture in my view. A very important picture. Because I said to you, back in the 1900s, in 90 years time, the committees involved are going to fight, have to fight just as hard to retain this race course and retain the race club. And regardless of who's on this picture, it, de it depicts the fight that the committees and anyone involved with racing and the club had to put forward to retain it. Next slide, the, the, the um, committee finally finally got some agreement on what to do. The Racing Ministry Development Authority re recommended Gawler was earmarked for closure. The South Australian Thoroughbred Racing Authority advised the club to produce a business plan. Todd Alexander Surveyors produced a business plan with input from the Committee, Management, Trainers Association. The main issue has been reshaping of the track, a deviation of Barnet Road, sale or lease of unused land, and the improvement of facilities. This is what had to be had to be taken at the time. And that was taken. Land at the southern end of the property was sale was sold. Completion of the new track and function centre aimed for the completion in, 19, in 2010. This was opened by, in 2010 by Premier Mike Graham. Next slide, please. Here we can see this is the stand that replaced the original one. Here's the old building is what's left of it, just here. This is where we found some of those um, uh, pieces of memorabilia. Now I want to point out this the bookmaker's ring was here, and we saw that on the own from Mel Tickle's photograph. This is the cover that was put up for the bookmaker's ring. Now this cover, go to the next slide please. Now that's that part of that bedding ring cover was converted into this. This is that same building converted into that. Lovely. That's a fantastic building, and that was by uh, Mr. Chris Martin's for us as civil engineering. He took that uh, old um, bookmaker's cover building down, revamped the uh, uprights and the roof, and he erected <coughs> this section here. Um, as a matter of fact, Mr. Wolfblass has requested, or did request last year, whether Chris Martin could actually construct another one, the same as this, at his Norwood Football Club, which he supports. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, addition to the club. The, new, the committee at the present moment have done a fantastic job in addition, in making this addition, this is a viewing platform on the side of that building you've just seen where you can actually view the mounting enclosure. And that's, that was put in by the current committee of the, of the Gordon Jockey Club. Um, and made the, the whole concept a continual viewing platform and a very easy place for people to uh, view races or just be uh, the new swimming pool. This is uh, the, the current committee at the present moment and the CEO. This was opened last year, late last year, 70 metres long, and that's been a huge asset also to the race course. The, and the current committee. Um, at, at, at the present moment. Uh, Ian, Ian is here tonight. Um, 
here and the past president and everything. Mrs. Biggins is also here tonight as well. And uh, Tony. Tony is also here tonight as well. The overall picture from the drone over the, this is what that area, that paddock as it was, looks like at the present moment. Bunnings is here, the Coles is here, Aldi is over here. This whole track moved this way, down here. Originally, this is the old building just here, that old building you saw. Originally, all the buildings were on that side here. Mm. Seems hard to believe now, but it's a fact. At, from, as of today, all the buildings are to the left of that building mm. down here. This track here is donated, the surface of that track is donated by a family of, of Mac Crab, and he has donated all the shelter for that track, and uh, all the club had to pay for, for was for the uh, transport. We have uh, a, a beautiful uh, uh, shelter track. We have, and we spoke about going the other way, the Sydney way as it's called, and uh, to clockwise, we actually use this for the non-racing people. We actually use that sand track on the inside to go the other way to give horses a chance to just have a bit of a change instead of going the racing way all the time. The new swimming pool is just here, and the trainers. These are uh, the trainers that are in the stable area, which I must mention, um, at the present moment, the first ones who moved into the, to the stables on the, on the opposite the school, Gary and Nicole Searle, they moved in in 2006 and commenced training. There's 75 stables in that complex altogether, and Darren Magro's in there, and Kerry and uh, Kerry McNulty, and Clint Binney and uh, Jeff Oakes has also purchased one of those stable complexes with the house. The, the new complex will be built, built over here for, uh, uh, in this year. The committee are arranging for new stables to be built for visiting trains. And here you can see the deviation of that, of the road that used to run straight through here. And that deviation of the road goes around here and back here again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we, the racing, as you've probably heard and you probably know, dominated by males since it even started in the country. Women, uh, including jockeys, had a very, in the 1900s, had a very, very late stage permission to ride in races. I have the we, we actually missed a slide or somewhere where uh, this particular lady we'll get to in a moment. But the first, this is the first lady. Is she here tonight? No, I don't know if she arrived. No, she did. This is the first lady, um, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Dulcie Cop. Dulcie, sorry, Dulcie Cobb, the first lady to be appointed, to be elected on the committee of the Gawler Jockey Club. The next lady, she's here tonight, Debbie, will you stand up Debbie please so we can see you? Now Debbie, <laughs> you, would you explain your first apprenticeship and you rode the first winner of a late, the first, you were the first lady jockey to ride a Metropolitan win, is that correct? Yes, I was, and I was the first female apprentice jockey in South Australia. I think I was the first female apprentice in Australia. Can't be, uh, it's Pam O'Neill. Pam O'Neill and Linda Jones from New Zealand rode before me, but they had full licenses. Oh, speak into the mic. Come over to the mic, Deb. Yeah, Linda Jones from New Zealand, she came up riding that late cup in SIJC gave her permission to, so I've, after, so I rode the first exhibition race winner at Wolfville in, when I was 16 years old, and five years later was when Linda Jones came up to ride in the Adelaide Cup, 
I thought, seeing they gave her permission to write, I could then do a five-month apprenticeship. But that horrible word tradition came through in racing, where the chairman of the stewards and Beasley said, no, no, apprentices have to complete their three-year apprenticeship before they turn 21. So I wasn't allowed to. But then fortunately, they had two exhibition ladies races in when I was 16 and 17. And after both of them, Colin Rookie, we had another steward, told my mum that I was ready to start my apprenticeship then. And thankfully, when Mr Beasley said no, I couldn't start it, Mr Rookie said that Debbie was ready when she was, when she could have got three years in. So for one thing, tradition was overruled in racing, very rare. A mature age apprenticeship came in. And I heard on racing.com only last year, one of the girls in Victoria wrote a win. They said she was a mature age apprenticeship, so I can say I changed racing. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Thanks for being there. And ladies and gentlemen, there's an, another lady here tonight. Well, I wonder who that is. <laughs> I wonder who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Jones. This is the first lady elected to the committee of as, as chairperson, chairwoman, chairman, whatever way you want to put it. And now, and Judy's jumping for joy here. I have here, after she took over as chairperson, it, with her background in local government, she made a submission, which I have here, to the council, stating to them in no uncertain terms that their rating of the race course was far, far too high compared with other venues in the uh, uh, racing. The end result was, with her personal presentation of that, the council reduced the Gawler race course rates by $23,000. You you stand up, please. <laughs> No small amount, is it? For each year. For each, each, year. each year. Yes, we were lucky enough um, when I did that presentation to the council that not only did we get it for one year, but they have actually enshrined it so we actually get it as a rebate for every year. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, God, for the the last one. Yeah. Now, we have a young lady here of 91 years old. And I would like her to stand up, please. If we'll bring, yeah, bring the microphone. Come up to the microphone, please. Yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, over there. This young lady, in 1951, One. One. 1951, long before Debbie could even attempt to get a license to ride you rode and this is interesting because I've, I've approached the South Australian Jockey Cup I've approached the, the Jockeys uh, uh, Association and none of them can match this at this stage by a woman on the Gawler race course there may be but we can't find it yet this lady rode a treble in 1951 on the Gawler race course. Three winners on the one, one day. Give her a hand. Gawler is home. Gawler is home. You say. Oh, well, thank you. Um, but um, it was in 1951 and the Hudson Hospital, they wanted to raise some money. So they decided to have a picnic race meeting on the Gawler race course. So, and of course I was very shy, I didn't want to ride. And um, anyway, so I had to go down to Adelaide because I was getting married, I think about a, a couple of weeks later, and I thought, oh, I was very embarrassed uh, type of thing. They had about, just about dragged me to get on the horse, but anyway. But I, we had, Dad only took two horses there, so. One there he put in like in different races, so although there was only, I only rode two horses, I rode three winners. Well done. <laughs> 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 Go 
Paul is on. He's in gold is on life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you for being a very patient uh, audience. And uh, it's been fun the last 12 months. We, we, unfortunately, we don't have time to do everything that we've researched, but uh, we've given you some basic ideas. There may be some time in the future when all this can be put into print. Um, we've shown you a few photographs tonight. At the present moment, we're up to about or over 150 photographs that are relevant to the actual race course. Um, and th anyhow, thank you very much for your attendance. What do you say after that? I cannot believe much time this man would have spent researching this with Judith and whoever part of his team is and the, uh, uh, the Goler history team. What a society. I'm going to have to come along a bit more often. Yeah. Because this is where everything used to translate into what was reality. People talking around the kitchen table, discussing history. Google everything. Do you want to Google everything? All I can say is, on behalf of the Goldenbar current Golden Barossa Jockey Club, Peter Jones and his team, I salute you. Thank you very much. Half of the dollar history team. Oh, here it is. I found it. Oh, enjoy. Thank you. I need it. Thank you very much. I need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good on. Okay.